Hello dear students, myself Sachin Gurule, Assistant Professor from KTHM College Nasik. In the previous video of the entomology first, we have learned the different types of antennae among the insects and we have also discussed the sensilla on the antennae and the functions of antennae. So, with this we have completed with the first appendages belongs to the head region of an generalized insect. Now, from this lecture we are going to start with the mouth parts in insects and the various modifications which is found in the mouth parts of the insect. And in the today's lecture we are going to discuss about the first classical mouth part that is mandibulate mouth parts. So, let us see mouth parts and their modification. Now, first of all what exactly the mouth parts? So, mouth parts can be defined as the appendages that surrounds the mouth opening are collectively referred as the mouth parts. These mouth parts are the organ concerned with the feeding comprising unpaired labrum in front, a median hypopharynx, a pair of mandible and maxillary maxillary from the lateral side and labium it forming a lower lip. So, it means there are different appendages which collectively referred as a mouth parts which includes a labrum, a pair of mandible, a pair of maxillary, single labium and at the center the hypopharynx. So, all these appendages collectively referred as the mouth parts. Now, the hypopharynx is primarily formed from a fusion of pair, la, a pair of lateral lobes and these pair of lateral lobes are referred as superlingui with a median lobe known as the lingua and this condition can be found into the pterygote insect. While in case of a pterygote, the lingua and superlingui are free from each other. So, this is the difference in the hypopharynx of the pterygote insect with that of the up pterygote insect. Now, there are according to the position, the mouth parts can be classified as the ectognathus and endognathus mouth parts. In the columbella, dipleura and proteura, the mouth parts are lie in the cavity of the head which is produced by the geni, which extend ventrally as a oral fold and meet in the ventral line below the mouth part. Now, this condition if it is there in the mouth part is referred as the endognathus condition means whatever appendages are there which are withdrawn into the small oral cavity which is formed by that gena and such a uh, condition can be referred as endognathus. While in the insects the mouth parts are not enclosed in this way, but they are external to the head such a condition is referred as the ectognathus condition and this ectognathus condition can be found into the mouth parts of orthoptera, lepidoptera and the diptera. So, most of the insects they are generally having the ectognathus condition while very few insects like the columbella, dipleura and proteura these are showing the ectognathus condition. Now, the appendages of mouth parts are varyingly modified among the insect in relation to their feeding habit. So, what kind of the feeding habit is shown by the insect accordingly the different appendages into the mouth parts they are get modified. So, Metcalf and his co-author in 1962 they have classified all these mouth parts into the major seven types and these seven types are the chewing type, rasping and sucking type, piercing and sucking type, sponging type, siphoning type, chewing and lapping type and degenerate or the filter type of the mouth parts. So, this is the classification is given by the Metcalf et al in 1962. They have classified all the different kinds of the mouth parts into the seven major types. Now, according to the Snodgrass, all types of mouth parts are independently evolved into the insect. 
without having remarkable phylogenetic significance. They are moreover evolved in accordance with the variable feeding habit means what kind of the feeding habit which is shown by the insect accordingly independently these mouth parts are evolved. So, this is the statement of the snodgrass. Now, among these chewing that is mandibulate and piercing and sucking types they are greatly modified one. The chewing type is further subdivided into the three types they they are referred as the subtypes of the chewing mouth parts. Now, chewing mouth parts are also referred as a mandibulate mouth parts and it has a subtype like a grinding, grasping, mandibulate and sectorial chewing type of the mouth parts. Similarly, the piercing and sucking mouth parts it is also having a four subtypes they are referred as the hemipteran PSM, PSM for piercing and sucking mouth part. Then anapleuran PSM, dipteran PSM and the siphonopteran PSM. So, in this way there are only two classical kind of the mouth parts. First one is a chewing, chewing mouth parts they are characteristic of the insect who are feeding on the solid food material and again according to their feeding habit they are may modified into the grinding type, grasping type, mandibulate type or the sectorial type while similarly in case of the piercing and sucking which is the second classical kind of the mouth part which is the characteristic or the peculiarity of the insect which are feeds on the liquid or the semi fluid uh, substance or the food material. So, they are only possesses a piercing kind of the mouth parts and according to the group for example, hemiptera they are shows a different type of PSM he is referred as a hemipteran PSM. Anapleura is another group, diptera is another group and siphonoptera is another group. So, they are called accordingly hemipteran PSM, anapleuran PSM, dipteran PSM and the siphonopteran PSM. So, this is about the introduction for the mouth parts. Now, and here we are going to start with the first classical kind of the mouth part that is referred as the chewing mouth part. The chewing mouth parts are also referred as the mandibulate mouth part. Now, these type represent the most primitive complex of the feeding appendages comprising the labrum, then epipharynx, hypopharynx and a pair of mandible, pair of maxillae and single labium. The labrum and labium forms the upper and lower lip respectively. So, this is a labrum which closes the anterior boundary hence it is referred as upper lip while the labium is encloses the lower boundary of the oral cavity hence it is referred as the lower lip. Then maxilla they are forms the cheeks of pre oral cavity as they are representing a lateral appendage while the mandibles are adapted these mandibles are adapted for the grind uh, cutting and grinding the solid food material into the smaller pieces. Now, the epipharynx as well as hypopharynx are the membranous and lobulated structure which has a two function. They push the food material into the true oral cavity that is known as a pharynx and another they also has a salivary orifice with the help of which they adds the saliva into the food material. Now, such a type of mouth parts are present into the opterygota, paleoptera, dictyoptera, orthoptera and other insects which primarily feed on the solid food material. Now, keep remember, so this is a peculiarity of the insects who are feeding on the solid food material. So, this is referred as the chewing and and chewing mouth parts so called as a mandibulate mouth parts. So, let us see one by one their appendages start with the labrum. Now, labrum is a broad lobe which is suspended from the clypeus. Now, we have already learned the head exoskeleton and the labrum is the first clearite which is suspended to the clypeus. So, but this labrum is actually the part of the mouth parts. It forms the upper lip. Now, on its inner side it is membranous and may be produced into the median lobe known as the epipharynx bearing a some sensilla also. And this sensilla 
may have a gustatory receptors that is the sense of the taste from inner side. The labrum is raised away from the mandibles by the two muscles arising into the head and inserted medially into the anterior margin of the labrum and these muscles obviously are the anterior muscles and the posterior muscles which are the paired muscle. Now, it, it, it is closed against the mandible in a part by two muscles arising in the head and inserted on the posterior lateral margins on the two small sclerites and these two small sclerites are referred as a tormi or singular is referred as a torma in but in some insect by resiling spring in the cuticle at the junction of labrum with the clypeus. The differential use of these muscles can produce a different kinds of the movement among the labrum which we have already discussed in a previous lecture and it produces a lateral rocking movement of the labrum which is very important during the mandibles are providing the grinding or the cutting action of the food material. So, this is about the first appendage known as the labrum. Then second one is a mandible. So, they are strongly chitinized structure. Chitinized in the sense it is heavily deposited with the protein known as a chitin which is very hard and are commonly referred as the jaws of insect. Now, why jaws? Because they are responsible for cutting the solid food material into the smaller pieces like that of we are having a teeth which is useful for mastication in, in case of insect these mandibles are responsible for mastication of the food material and hence they are commonly known as the jaws. Now, they articulate in a transverse plane in Thysanura and the Pterygota the mandibles are referred as a dicondylic one. Dicondylic in the sense the mandibles they are articulated with the cranium and the two points. Now, there are two kinds of the mandibles are uh, articulation can be seen. First one is a monocondylic mandible, mono in the sense single, condyle means only the single articulation point. When the mandibles are attached to the head capsule with the help of single articulation point, such a kind of the mandibles are referred as the monocondylic mandible and is a characteristic of the lower insects or up pterygote insect, while the dicondylic condition is found into the order Thysanura and rest of all the pterygota they are provided with a dicondylic mandibles that is the mandibles they are provided with a two articulation point. So, here in this diagram you can easily see there are two articulation points here and as there are two articulation points it is referred as the dicondylic mandible which is the characteristic or which indicating the highly evolved insect and the pterygotes. They articulate with the primary posterior and secondary anterior condyles at the subgena. Means there are two articulation point. One is a primary and second primary posterior, and second one is a secondary anterior condyle. And both these condyles are lies at the subgena. Now one condyle, the ginglimus, articulates with that of the convex process of the clypeus, while the other condyle is usually set free to move into the socket at the lower end of gena and the post gena. So, with the help of these two articulation point these mandibles are get attached or articulated with that of the head capsule and referred as the dicondylic mandibles. Now, in rest of the up pterygota and among the ephemeropteran nymphs the mandibles are provided with only single condyle. So, here in this diagram there are two diagrams actually. So, one, this is a monocondylic condition in both the here you can see. So, this is a plane transverse plane with which this mandible they are articulated with the head capsule and there is only a single articulation point with the help of which this mandible is articulated with the head capsule. So, this condition is very much reflect into the all up pterygota except the thysanura which has a dicondylic condition. But if you may ptera, these are the pterygote insect, but their larvae still contains a monocondylic mandible having a single articulation point. The mandibles are provided with a strong adductor and abductor muscles, from which is arising from the dorsal and lateral walls of the cranium. 
Now, these muscles are responsible for addition and again retrieving the mandible from their, uh, their added condition. So, there are also the ventral adductor muscles of origin of the anterior tentorial arms in the ephemeropter and the odonate larvae and also in some adults of isoptera, orthoptera except acridity means sometimes suppose so this one is the anterior tentorial arm from the anterior tentorial arms again that ventral adductor muscles are also originated and this anterior uh, ventral adductor muscles are also joined with that of uh, or they are innervated into the mandible for their movement but this is not the condition universal condition and not found in all insect it is only found into the adults of isoptera and orthoptera but among the orthoptera again it is uh, not sh shown into the family known as the ac uh, called as the acridity now mandibles are usually short and strongly sclerotized and cuticular uh, cuticles of the cusp is often hardened by presence of zinc and the manganese means whatever dentitions are there at the apical portion there is a deposition of the zinc and the man manganese and hence the teeth of that mandibles are very hard or the cusp uh, they are referred as a cusp which are often harder due to such a kind of the deposition. Now, these curves may become worn out during the feeding, but the distribution of the harder areas of the cuticle that provides a self sharpening also. Means with the use of this mandible that cusp becomes, um, becomes a worn out and self sharpening can be provided by the arrangement of the hardened areas of the cuticle which uh, locks with one another and automatically they are get self sharpen. Now, mandibles carry out the function of biting and chewing of the food material into the orthopteroid insect. The dentition of the mandible is evolved among different group of insect in accordance to the food material. So, what kind of the food material is um, feeding feed by that insect accordingly dentition is also get evolved. In the phytophagous insect teeth they are generally blunt one like that of the molar and these teeth are referred as the molar cusp. So, if the molar cusp are only present on the mandible it is indicating that insect are herbivorous that is feeding on the plant material while in case of the carnivorous insect the teeth which are located on the mandibles they are slightly pointed like that of the incisor while in case of the omnivorous insect both uh, these uh, cusps are present incisor cusps are located at the distal portion and at the basal portion there are molar cusps representing the omnivorous nature of the insect. So, if the insect is carnivore feeding on the flesh then the mandibular clusk are of incisor type. If the phytophagous insect is there then the cusp of the mandibles are of molar type and if the insect are omnivorous for example, if you see the cockroach, cockroaches feeds on both vegetable material as well as the flesh. So, their distal portion contains a incisor cusps and the basal region contains a molar cusps representing the omnivorous nature of the insect. So, in this way all these dentition or so cusp of the mandibles are concerned with the grinding of the food material and hence they are referred as the jaws. So, this is about the mandible. The next appendage is referred as the maxillae. The maxillae occupies a lateral position one on each side of the head just behind the mandibles. These paired structures are homologous with the typical first pair of maxillae of the crustacean insect and the other arthropodan organism. The proximal part of the maxilla consists of the basal segment known as the cardo which has a single articulation with that of the head. So, there is only single articulation point with the help of which this maxillae attach with the head capsule and it has a flat plate. This flat plate is referred as the stipes which is hinged to the 
cardo means the joint which is present between the cardo and stipes is a hinge joint so the movement between the cardo and the stipes is allowed in some uh, some de uh, some degree so uh, both cardo and stipes are loosely joined to the head by the membra uh, membrane so that they are capable of the movement now distally on the stipes there are two lobes the inner lobe is referred as the lacinia and the outer one can be referred as the gallia so laterally on the stipes a jointed leg like uh, pulp is made up of a number of segment is characterized and this is referred as the maxillary pulp now in case of orthopteroid insect it is typically composed of total five segments so here we, if you see the segment first second third fourth and five there are five segmented maxillary pulpi which is the most common condition can be found into the orthopteroid insect so this is the morphological part of that maxilla now this maxilla it bears a single condyle on the cardo which with the help of which it is articulate with the head capsule now it articulates with the lateral tergal region of the cranium so lateral tergal region is a point of articulation where exactly this maxillary are get attached to the maxillary segment of the head capsule now each maxillary is innervated from the various muscles in a different region the anterior and the posterior rotor muscle so here in this diagram you can see the anterior and the posterior rotor muscles are inserted into the cardo so this is a cardo and ventral adductor muscles these ventral adductor muscles which are arising on the tentorium are inserted both into the cardo and the stipes means it is the cardo is provided with the two kinds of muscle posterior and anterior rotor muscles and which is <clears throat> coming from the cranium and the second one so this is a anterior tentorial arm from the tentorial arm the ventral adductor muscles are there this ventral adductor muscles are innervated both in a cardo as well as in a stipes the next part one is a lacinia lacinia is innervated by a cranial flexor muscle so these are the flexor muscles which are referred as a cranial flexor muscles which are coming from the cranium which is inserted into the <coughs> lacinia now this cranial flexor muscles are in fact the extension of the anterior rotator uh, rotator dorsal muscles then the next one is a flexor muscles so these are here you can see the flexor muscles these are arising into the stipes and innervates into the lacinia and the gallia means they are originate from the stipes and they are inserted into the both inner as well as outer lobe that is lacinia and the gallia but neither lacinia lacinia nor gallia has an extensor muscles means they are only provided with the flexor muscles but extensor muscles are absent both in lacinia as well as in a gallia the pulpi has a levator and depressor muscle so these are the levator muscles and these are the depressor muscles so both these levator muscles and depressor muscles they are innervating uh, into the pulpi and which arises from the stipes and each segment of the pulp has a single muscle causing the flexing of the next segment so here in each segment there is a another muscle is there and which these muscles are responsible for movement of individual segment of that maxillary pulp now the maxillary has the function as a second pair of jaw and this maxillary is also actively involved into the process of cutting and grinding the food material and sometimes they are also provided with a gustatory receptor and this gustatory receptor are having the function of the taste of the food material now insects they do not have Uh, the appendages which uh, the legs or the hands which put the food material and push into the oral cavity so for assisting the mandible when mandibles are providing the cutting action in of uh, during which the solid food material is cutting into the smaller pieces these lacinia gallia and the maxillary pulpi they are responsible for giving a support to the food material they hold the food material Uh, across the mandible so that the food material is uh, cut into the smaller pieces so that is only the function of the maxillary so this is about the maxillary 
The next structure is referred as the labium. The labium is similar in structure to that of the maxillae, but with the appendages of the two sides, they are fused into the median line. So, if you divide this labium exactly into the center and if you compare the structure of the labium of the lateral side with that of the maxillae, you will found that it has a similar uh, structure or appearance to that of the maxillae, but it, <coughs> it closes the pre oral cavity from the lower side and hence it is commonly known as the lower lip. The labium is composed of the distal segment. So, this distal segment is referred as the prementum and the proximal segment is referred as the postmentum. The prementum and the postmentum are separated by a transverse suture. So, this is a transverse suture which is responsible for separation of the prementum from that of the postmentum that suture is referred as the labial suture. So, this is a labial suture which separating the prementum from that of the postmentum. Now, the postmentum is further subdivided into the proximal segment. The proximal segment is referred as the submentum and the distal one is referred as the mentum. So, this can be condition which is well evident into the orthopteroid insect, but not necessary in all insect that postmentum has these two division. In generalized way, the labium is having the distal most segment known as a prementum and the basal segment known as the postmentum. But sometimes, due to the presence of this transverse suture, and this transverse suture is responsible for separating the area of the postmentum into the distal one is known as a mentum and uh, the basal one is referred as the submentum. From the base of the prementum are differentiating a pair of lateral lobes and that lateral lobes are referred as the palpigar. So, these are the palpigar. From each palpigar bears a labial palp, which is again a jointed leg like structure, but now this time this labial palp is only having a usually three segment. The labial palp is a sensory organ and it is composed of either 1 to 4 segment, but commonly it is contains the 3 segments only. On the distal margin of the prementum, so this is the distal margin, on the distal margin of the prementum bears a 2 pair of lobes. The outer lobes are referred as the paraglossa and the inner lobe are referred as the glossa. In some insects, the lobes of both of this pair, they are fused together to form a single structure which is referred as the ligula. Means, when these lobes are not completely separated, they are more or less get fused with one another forming a single structure that is referred as a ligula. So, ligula is present in this area which is actually the fusion of the glossa with that of the paraglossa. Only the prementum and its appendages are innervated by the muscles. Now, the ventral adductor muscles, ventral adductor uh, muscles arising from the tentorium and innervate the front and uh, the ventral side of the prementum. Then the flexor muscles are innervating the glossa and paraglossa, while levator and the depressor muscles uh, to the pulp uh, forms a prementum itself. So, there are different kinds of the musculature only. Again, keep remember the postmentum is never innervated by any kind of the muscles. Whatever muscles are there, the muscles are only going into the prementum region. So, it includes the retractor muscles of the prementum, then these are again the muscles which are coming from the tentorium, these are the depressor muscles, flexor muscles. Again, the intrinsic muscles are also there in a each segment of the labial pulp for the purpose of the movement. There are the extensor and flexor muscles into the pulp and pair of retractor muscles is also supplied to the prementum. So, this is about the musculature of the uh, labium. Now, this labium is also responsible for helping the grinding action. So, these are also the uh, structure, the labial palpi, which is also responsible for holding the food material when mandibles are providing a grinding action. But most importantly, 
these are the sensory structure the sensory receptors are present on the structure known as the glossa paraglossa and the labial pulp so this is about the labium and the last appendage belongs to the chewing type or the mandibulate mouth part is a hypopharynx the hypopharynx is a median lobe immediately behind the mouth okay so I, I, all other appendages just we have discussed all they are usually surrounding the hypopharynx means hypopharynx is located in the center of all these appendages the salivary duct usually opens behind it between it and the labium. So, most of the hypopharynx is the membranous, but the adoral face of the sclerotized distally and proximally it contains a pair of suspensory sclerite which extend upward to the end into the lateral walls of the stomodium. So, that is only the membranous part and the distal portion which are generally uh, is the sclerotized one. Now, the muscles arising on the fronds are inserted into these sclerites which distally are hinged to a pair of lingual sclerite. The various muscles serves to swing the hypopharynx forward and back because the hypopharynx is generally having the main function of pushing the food material into the true oral cavity like that of the we are having a tongue. So, this hypopharynx is nothing but the analogous to the tongue of the mammals. So, it is also serving to push the food material into the true oral cavity. So, for the purpose of movement again the muscles are provided into the hypopharynx which is responsible for uh, swinging the hypopharynx in a forward and backward condition. And in case of the cockroach there are two more muscles running across the hypopharynx which dilate the salivary orifice and expand the salivarium so that saliva can be comes out and mix with the food material. Now, in case of the upterigota, larval epimeroptera and dermaptera, there are two lateral lobes. These two lateral lobes are referred as the hypopharynx uh, of the hypopharynx are called as the superlingui. So, the superlingui, these are the lateral lobes which are separated in case of the upterigot, but here in case of the pterigot hypopharynx you can see the superlingui these are get fused with the median lingula. So, this is a median one here these lobes are separated, but in case of pterigot these lobes are get fused with one another forming a single composite structure known as the hypopharynx. So, this is about the different kinds of the appendages which are found into the first classical kind of the mouth part that is chewing mouth part we have learned the labrum, then pair of mandible, pair of maxillae, labium and the hypopharynx. So, thank you, thank you very much.